And let's take the elevator music out and we can start. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of Industry Meets Science. This is a live talk series in which we discuss innovations from Germany, as you just saw, to meet global challenges as they are presented at this very moment at the World Expo in Dubai. My name is Nico Palosuo. And now you can see me more clearly. And I'll be hosting these talks from my virtual studio which has a super low carbon footprint, let me assure you. Together with uh, Forschungszentrum Jülich, we have been running these shows already a couple of times. Both organizations are presenting exhibits at the German Pavilion. So if you are in Dubai, be sure to check them out. The expo is open until the end of March. Today, we talk about future cities. We talk about architecture and we talk about mobility. And we'll put a special emphasis on the role of high-rise buildings because they appear to be popping up like mushrooms in the rain, which is a Finnish saying, but maybe also a Spanish and English saying. We talk about the influence of design uh, and urban planning, and we'll discuss the challenges of mobility solutions. After all, cities need to be great places to work and live. And as people and activities move more and more into cities, the only way is up, or is it? I guess we'll soon find out. Which brings me to today's panelists. And we couldn't be more honored to have this group with us today. Let me put them up on screen. Here we are. Let's start on location in Dubai, where we have Benjamin Piper, associate partner and design principal from Kila Design. Welcome, Ben. Thank you very much, Nico. Fantastic introduction. <laughs> Kila is known for, for a lot of things, among others, the boldly shaped museum of the future in Dubai, which, you know, it has a hole in the middle. And mm -hmm. I also like the 3D printed offices in the same city. Great to have you with us, Ben. Thank you very much. Great to be part of the show. Next up is VP Business Development Javier Sesma from TKE, which stands for TK Elevators formerly known as Group Elevators, now an independent brand and very much the innovator it has always been. Welcome, Javier. Hi, uh, thank you very much. And, and, and thanks for the opportunity for being with, uh, with you today. So TKE is a fellow German exhibitor at the World Expo, uh, featuring many of their innovations there. Um, and now Javier, um, Ben was from Dubai, but you're joining us from somewhere in, in north of Spain. North of Spain, yes, Asturias, north of Spain. Fantastic. And last but definitely not least, Anthony Wood, president on the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, an organization which has been advancing sustainable vertical urbanism since 1969, straight from the Windy City. Anthony, fantastic to have you with us. It's fantastic to be here, but I would much rather be in Dubai, I can tell you. Here in Chicago, it's about minus 15 degrees Celsius outside. So I'd much rather be with you in, in Dubai right now, but it's a pleasure to be involved. Before we go into the discussion, let me remind our amazing audience that you can ask questions and make your comments in the chat, as always. You know, our guests are true experts in their fields with amazing experience. You know, just Google these guys. So... Use your chance and get your fingers warmed up. And to be truly interactive, let's open up also a Slido poll 
which I'll be showing with you shortly. So here is the Slido poll. I'm asking you guys under, you go to Slido, Slido.com or Slido.do, type in hashtag expo and give us your thoughts. Which city is your role model for the future? And let's see if we can tickle some comments from our experts uh, as we go along. So I, I want to start with, with a fresh commentary on, 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 on the situation um, which we have today and which is, I think, pretty obvious. It's the pandemic and its effect on, on cities and also on urban areas. I mean, we can all see that it has had an impact on use of office space. I mean, we are all at home uh, at, at this uh, place. Omicron is all over the place. So how has the pandemic affected the move in, into higher buildings? And uh, Anthony, let's let's start with you as, as Chicago. I, I, I read this. Chicago is home to the world's first modern skyscraper. I wonder if it still exists. It does not exist, unfortunately. It only lasted about 30, 40 years before they knocked it down to build something taller, which, of course, is, a, is an issue uh, with a lot of uh, buildings around the world. But, um, no, I mean, you know, to go back to your question about how has the pandemic hit cities, it hit cities, it hit societies in, 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 in so many ways, which we, you know, will become more and more apparent in the years ahead. But, you know... I, I think we've got to set the context here. I think we've got to set the context. You know, United Nations statistics show that there are a million people. This may have been slow during the pandemic, by the way, but, but, but about, a, about a million people urbanizing on this planet every week, every week for the next 30 years. Okay, so let's get the context. That means one million people moving into cities or being born into cities around the world every week. So the next question is, where the hell do those people go? You know, that, that, so we as a species on this planet need to build the equivalent of Chicago every month to cope with this expansion. Um, and what we've seen over the last 20, 30 years has been an explosion of tall building construction around the world. I think you have a graph, one of our graphs to show this, uh, yeah. Nico, and, and you know, your viewers might not be able to see the detail here, but basically in the 1990s and prior to the 1990s, the entire world was building on average about 12 projects greater than 200 meters in height, um, only 12 projects. And then you can see from the 1990s onwards, and in the last decade, the entire world was building about 112 of these projects. So there's been this explosion of tall buildings, which is driven by many different factors. It's driven by ego. It's driven by cities competing with each other and feeling they need to have a skyline to compete. It's driven by commerce, but it's also driven by this requirement to house a million new urban dwellers every week. And so, you know, against that context, um, the, the COVID pandemic is going to have a massive impact on, on life work scenarios, on, on, on the city, on mobility. It already is. But, but, you know, it's not going to, it's, some people have called the death of the city, the death of the tall building, you know, as a result of COVID. And I can, I can categorically say that that is not going to happen. And, and, and uh, you know, and I'll conclude this little segment just by saying the last time, we uh, concluded the death or, or announced the death of the tall building with almost 20 years ago to the day in, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. You know, that event was so gargantuan that people could never imagine living, working and recreating in tall buildings after what happened with the collapse of the World Trade Center. Well, I am here to tell you that 84 percent of tall buildings that exist around the world today, 84 percent of 200 meter plus tall buildings around the world have been built since 9-11. And that is thousands of buildings. So certainly 9-11 did not result in the death of the tall building, in the death of density. And I don't believe that COVID will either. And, and, and final thing, if it does result in the death of density, then we've got an even bigger problem in terms of you know carbon sustainability and climate change. 
Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. I, I think these are really important uh, comments to make, to put things into perspective. Uh, what shocks to the society have happened and what impact they have or have not had on the societies uh, on that time. Maybe, Ben, you can build on this. I mean, you are in Dubai. World Expo is in Dubai. I mean, surely we can see Dubai. I mean, it, it's a really a spra sprawling city, but it has also been hit by the pandemic. And maybe the World Expo is, is, is also uh, an, 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 an example of that. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Ben? Well, look, um, my thoughts on, on, on Dubai <clears throat> in general is that, uh, you know, sometimes visitors to Dubai, maybe coming for the first time, are, are kind of seeking this idea of an authentic uh, city and there are maybe somehow feeling slightly disappointed. And, and Dubai, as an example, has a, has a, a kind of a reputation of, of somehow being inauthentic. But I take quite a different view, actually. I think that the fact that Dubai has, has, has grown so quickly over the past number of years uh, means it is actually a very authentic city in the sense of it, it is a representation of the way that society and, and city building is working today. And, and never before have we had this sort of phenomenon of centrally master planned or more or less instantaneous kind of cities, which is, which is certainly in the last sort of 10, 20 years, uh, you know, to Anthony's point, had to deal with these massive uh, urbanization of the world, of the world population. Um, so I think it's really interesting because you may, you may take issue with certain of the aesthetic aspects uh, of, of a place like Dubai, but it is a reflection of um, sort of uh, the, what, what can happen when, when, when capital and marketing um, and, different, uh, and different kind of um, uh, people around the world are connected in, in, in a new and unique way. <clears throat> and I think one of the big surprises that I always uh, remember when first coming here, because I saw, originally I saw Dubai um, as a skyline, and I just assumed, having lived in, in other, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, tall cities in the past, in, in New York and a short while in, in Chicago, I just assumed it was more or less the same kind of dynamics that led to that tall skyline. <clears throat> but there's moments that when you're up in some of these tall buildings, especially on Sheikh Zayed Road, which is the main drag or the main strip of the city, you can see empty desert within about half a kilometer. And the, the, the forces at play in Dubai are more complex and more layered than simply a sort of uh, manifestation of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the land value that you might get in a more traditional kind of uh, city. I think Anthony's point about the, the role of ego and, and this, this desire to represent oneself, whether as a, as a nation, as a city, as a brand, as an individual, through uh, this built expression, uh, and this is where the kind of sculptural and psychological aspect of tall buildings really comes into play. Many of the tall buildings that we have here in Dubai, as an example, are not strictly required from a land use perspective. Um, but we find ourselves in a, in a city with plenty of land actually being the, the tallest uh, city per capita uh, in the world. And, and I think that's an interesting relationship between, um, uh, you know, the, the, the desire um, to make a mark uh, and, 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 and how that's translated into architecture. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, the tall tower is not necessarily the densest way to inhabit um, a, a large human population. There's quite a few studies that look at courtyard typologies, which lower rise can actually achieve a much greater density. Um, but these require very, very large land plots and they're, they're large uh, building projects. And in a way, uh, the, the, the land division um, sets into, into motion the, the, the sort of res resulting urban, uh, um, urban, ur urban form, uh, you could say. So there's a many layers to the, to the whole question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Thanks, thanks, Ben. I think we all look at Dubai with fascination on, on how it has developed and in, in a such stark contrast. Uh, uh, with the nature, um, and of course, with the with the global climate goals, we'll be discussing also later a little bit about sustainability on how to combine these these different different goals. Um, uh, Javier, um, you work for a company that is truly global. I mean, you work all around the world. TK Elevators all around the world. Um, what's your kind of point of view on on the effect on the pandemic, and maybe on where we are right now uh, with the state of the cities? I, I think uh, I mean I mean there is there is no no doubt, and I think. Anthony has shown that, um, I mean, we have seen different uh, crises in the past, but if we look at overall picture as of today, uh, maybe uh, 
the first thing that we need to take into account is that about 2 billion people will additionally live in cities in, in 2050. So if, if, if you look at how does it look like to, to places like uh, uh, to big cities. So this means that uh, probably another example uh, uh, complementing to what Anthony was saying, uh, prior to the pandemic, there was about a city of the size of Manhattan being built every day. So, so I think there is no doubt that, uh, I mean, let's say urbanization is growing up. Uh, this will mean that uh, in the in the uh, in, in in 2050, this 70 percent of urban population has inverted trend of 100 years ago. So 100 years ago, there was about 30 percent of people in the world living in cities, versus 17. 70 percent in 2050 but even going higher if we look at the cities maybe like like uh, shanghai uh, for instance uh, um, there is a let's say a, a, a big impact of a, a also a big city so as of today about seven 60 percent of the gross domestic profit is coming from 600 cities so so there is about 70 cities which are more than six million people so uh, so and also, I mean, just just adding maybe some caveat to what uh, what Ben was mentioning. I mean, let, let's take the example of of Dubai. Uh, yes, I mean, it's right. Dubai, all these buildings were not maybe necessary, but as of Dubai, it's it's, it's an example of a city that has 85 percent of the population is urban. Likely will and probably Ben can add, but it will be maybe 90 percent. And, and has the biggest concentra uh, concentration of super tall buildings. So, so it almost duplicates the, 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 the amount that you have in the following cities like Guangzhou and Shenzhen with uh, 21 mega tall buildings. So, I mean, from our perspective, there is no doubt there is a trend for high, for high density. And, and that will require probably a think of how we want to design buildings, how we want to uh, uh, live, work, and entertain on, on those buildings uh, with different building uses. And, and I'm sure that uh, that Ben will have a lot of ideas on, on, on those elements. Thanks. And Ben, you are muted right now? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, my apologies. I just think on this point of the pandemic, it is interesting what it's done to the to the property market in Dubai, which has traditionally had a very, very strong emphasis on the high rise, as, as you mentioned. But but the pandemic in particular has really made people appreciate their personal space like never before. Um, not only from a sanitary perspective in terms of you know nervousness around sharing elevators or public corridors with large populations of of tower neighbors as it were but also from the personal space in order to expand with the whole working from home or or the general kind of lockdown so there's been a bit of a shift uh in terms of the uh, uh aspirations a lot of uh, tower dwellers are looking uh you know to 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 be getting closer to the ground now this might just be a a slight you know um blip uh in the progress and then what you're describing really before in terms of urbanization globally i'm sure uh, you know is is carrying on uh at quite a rate but i do think that's something that's quite interesting that's come out of the whole covid phenomenon so thanks 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 ben um just looking at where we are with the Paul, right now, our audience thinks Singapore and New London and Old London um, stand in for their role models of of, of the future. But but uh, Ben and Javier, what you just also mentioned, mentioned and Anthony, um, the role of the buildings seem to be changing not only because of Corona but because of all the other things we are witnessing uh, right now. I can remember actually, you know, when I grew up in Finland. Uh, I watched Dynasty and Dallas, of course, like the kids <laughs> in that area. And they all worked in this glass facade uh, high-rise building. And I, I wonder if the, uh, you know, the, 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 the high-rise of the American 80s is probably a thing of the past from a conceptual level. And if we think mm -hmm. about the urban realm going forward, the public environments, the ecosystem that the high-rises uh, really represent, I, I wonder how they will be evolving in the coming years. Uh, yeah. And Ben, ben, ben we, con we continue with you because I know Kila has been talking a lot about the context of the building. 
I mean, it's not just the building itself. It's really where 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 it is. So maybe you can yeah. elaborate on that. Well, sure. Look, I think your your point about the sort of uh, you know American 1980s interpretation of modernism and how that kind of spread to many parts of the world, including uh, Dubai, uh, you know, led to the situation of what some people have referred to as an iced tea kind of building. It's the worst case scenario, actually. If you think about the the the, the drink iced tea. The first thing you do in iced tea is you boil water, so that's you know pretty energy intensive. By the way, if you boil water in uh, in Dubai, it's already been desalinated, so it's it's already got a lot of embodied energy. You boil the water up, you make the tea, and then you add the ice to bring the temperature right down. So in terms of embodied energy, it's the basically the worst drink you can have, and that's more or less what these uh, uh, these glass buildings um, uh, that of which we have many here in Dubai. Uh, are their iced tea buildings where uh, uh, they're built um, to give as much uh, uh, natural daylight as possible, and then they're engineered um, both in terms of the facade uh, and in terms of the MEP systems um, to cope with all that that heavy load. And now there's some very interesting technology in terms of um, glazing performance that's that's uh, developed uh, recently uh, to help you know bring those energy loads down. Um, but I suppose. You know, as as a firm here working in the Middle East, um, and, and as architects, like any architects, really, we try to uh, uh, approach um, the problem of how to design our buildings from first principles. We'll look at the the environment, we'll look at the culture, um, we'll look at the context, and we try to respond in a very bespoke way um, to the particulars of of a given site uh, or, or project. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Um, Anthony, you have been talking a, a lot about. The context of buildings as well. Um, I think you mentioned somewhere in your in your presentations that you feel that you know all all skyscrapers shouldn't be alike. They definitely shouldn't be uh, alike. Um, so maybe yeah. uh, Anthony, you can you can comment also also to, you know the the role of buildings. I mean, is the '80s J.R. Ewing building coming back? Well, let's hope not. Hey, <laughs> um, but you know. I mean, I'm going to go a stage further than Ben. Perhaps I can in my position, although it surprises a lot of people when I say what I'm about to say. You know, I think that 95% plus of tall buildings in existence today are really not good pieces of design at all. Um, I think, you know, and, 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 and the reason for that is because most tall buildings, the 95%, are driven by one of two de design directions. The first is, they're just a commercial box. I'm not even sure they're architecture. That, that's the JRU in the Dallas, the glass tower. It's maximum efficient floor plan extruded through, you choose 40, 60, 80 stories and, um, and clad in, in glass. Um, it's just a, about a commercial return. The second type of building is where the piece, the, 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 the tall building is designed as a piece of sculpture. You know, and sometimes quite, you know, crazy forms. And, and that might result in kind of a more interesting tall building, but the relationship between the building and the city is just a visual one. It's a relationship that says, hey, I think I'm beautiful, behold me. And that's really not what architecture is about at all. You know, because by the way, next door there's another, hey, I think I'm beautiful, behold me. And what we get is the city is a zoo. The city is a menagerie of competing icons that self-cancel each other out. Now, here's the irony. Some of these cities where these buildings are located have hundreds, and in some cases, thousands of years of vernacular tradition in architecture, meaning that architecture used to be a response to its place. It had to be. It had to be. We didn't have energy to be able to, you know, um, uh, ignore the environment yeah. you know, so the building had to be a response to its site environmentally physically socially materially you know we couldn't mine materials in australia ship them for fabrication in china and deliver them on site in germany or you know whatever so the bill and that's why when you travel around the world and this is largely why people travel around the world every place is different because, and the architecture is a big factor in that. If you think about, you know, the Chinese pagoda, the Islamic mosque, the Western cathedral, whatever, you know, whatever typology you look at, it evolved differently as a response to place. 
the 1950s modern architecture that all went out the window you know and and this 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 rectilinear air conditioned isolated box isolated from all contact became the predominant model and still today unfortunately a large percentage of buildings are still built to that model you know and and and, and so you know so to me um, we've got to increase density in cities. We've got to go with the vertical realm. The horizontal realm is completely unsustainable in terms of land use and the infrastructure to support such existence. But the tall building itself is only several baby steps, in my view, along the path it needs to tread to truly become sustainable. And, and really what we're talking about, we're talking about a whole bunch of things. We're talking about green walls. We're talking about public communal space. We're talking about use of roof plane. We're talking about solidity and opacity in buildings and not built out all of glass. We're talking about mass timber. We're talking about vegetation, growing produce in buildings. We're talking about 20, 30 things that only, is, you're seeing some examples up on your screen now. So. When I say 95% of tall buildings are not great, fortunately, 5% of them, which is still hundreds and hundreds of buildings, are fantastic. But the ones that are fantastic really break out of this predominant approach. This is a building in Tokyo, which those that's not just green wall. That's vegetables and fruit, which is eaten inside the office building, you know, the project you're seeing up there. So... Um, so we've got to break out from these anim these these things becoming commercial animals or just iconic sculptural animals and get back to you know indigenous architecture i believe there can be a chinese tall building a dubai a middle eastern tall building an australian tall building an american tall building and these things are all different so i i think that's uh anthony really inspiring to listen to you and talk about what a building should be um, and how it should reflect the environment and the use and the needs of the people. Uh, and I think some of these examples that we saw are really, really uh, out of this world if you indeed compare to some of the, let's say, monoblock design that we see still in, in many parts of, of the world. Javier, let me come back to you. As somebody who is, who is uh, through your company, you see all kinds of uses for buildings, all kinds of purposes for buildings. You guys deliver technology to really, I can, I can imagine, uh, all kinds of of needs. So what are your perspectives on, 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 on the role of buildings and how do they evolve? What, what are the some of the trends that you're seeing from your point of view? Well, I mean, I'm, 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 I like very much the example of, of, the, of the ice, uh, of the ice tea, I think, Ben, that is a very good <laughs> representation of a glass building. Uh, so, so I think, um, I mean, for somebody that has the challenge to bring people to buildings, so for somebody that, as, as, as Anthony was saying, to a certain extent, some of these buildings were become uh, vertical cities or vertical silos, let me take a, a wider perspective. Let me take the perspective of that building within the city. I think, I think the challenge we don't have as of today is uh, also a little bit of a dichotomy between uh, super and mega tall buildings and the, and the consumption of energy. I mean, as of today, where 30 percent of the of the energy consumed worldwide happens in buildings in uh, uh, elevator being a, a little bit 10 percent of that i mean we don't have a responsibility so so buildings versus consuming of energy also the way we are going to live in cities i think anthony was putting a very nice example about, about buildings okay uh, so from that uh, from that uh, let's say perspective uh, also, we need to also understand how buildings are going to be used and also the new the new trends. I mean, something that we see typically in building traffic uh, in the in the in the past, we used to call it the Starbucks effect, which is which is everybody goes to the office, uh, goes to their desk, go to the Starbucks and then to take a coffee and go back. That challenge all the all the elevator traffic uh, algorithms. OK, now is e-commerce. Okay, so how do we bring goods to these buildings? And then uh, also, um, at the end of the day, I mean, we are doing buildings to have a better places to work, to live, or to entertain. Okay, so so people need to come to buildings. So, so how do we bring sustainable, sustainable people to this building? What about multimodal seamless mobility? I mean, the most efficient mean of transportation in, in big cities is, is, is obviously public transport. So how do we make sure that those buildings are not just silos? 
and are connected. And then, uh, I mean, considering, let's say, everything that is being built, uh, being built, and I think Anthony was mentioning that, um, how we can reuse or recycle what is out there to make sure we convert those spaces in more livable cities. And, and maybe the last, the last item is, is uh, I mean, are we going to build buildings the same way we have done before? And, and I'm sure Ben can comment on that, but modularity, uh, uh, flexibility for that mixed use, not everything should be high rise, also low rise. So, so, so creating those spaces to live and entertain is interesting. Mm, maybe uh, I would just, uh, just an example. I mean, you mentioned pandemic, uh, I, I think, Nico, and, 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 and maybe let, let me bring an example of our experience with um, COVID-19 and, 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 and data. So, 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 so we took more than 60,000 elevators we had in the US that are connected to the cloud and just using the power of that data, so we are able to assess the activity in buildings. I think Anthony was mentioned about success of a building. Okay, using data, we can monitor, and, and it's impressive to see how COVID has affected the number of uh, trips in buildings, almost 61%, but how using data, we can even assess the activity in buildings in the in the in North American winter storm, in Thanksgiving, uh, in Christmas, uh, or also sometimes how we can understand how this is going to affect the different building types and different sectors. I mean, uh, uh, let's take uh, healthcare, office, or hospitality, or even residential, or even how we can care about using data uh, the success of of, of, of those. Uh, economies of those sectors and and maybe we, we could do that as of today uh, breaking by by state by country even by city so so i think there are two probably ways of looking at that and maybe this is an example of the us or so so we can see the effect of pandemic but we could also think on the effect of of good design neighborhoods so we can carve out using data almost by city by building type and, and it's interesting because at the end of the day, as of today, we design buildings to be successful places to live, uh, and and we can using data understand whether we have been successful or whether maybe those buildings that were built before what would uh, modernize or renovate for a different purpose, which is I think something which is happening because of because of COVID very much, eh? reuse of buildings for a different space in. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, probably Ben and Anthony has a lot of very good examples on that. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I just wanted to make the point what you were saying about the kind of the smart data aspect is mm. I, am, I often walk around cities or buildings or car parks or spaces in general and think, my gosh, you know, this thing is basically not being used most of the time and it exists only for that small amount of time where maybe somebody's parked there or somebody's sleeping in that space or somebody's using that bit of office. And I think that there is a great deal of opportunity in terms of how we can use information technology, AI, pattern recognition, uh, social networking to really optimize the use of the existing infrastructure that we have. And you see signs of it in, let's say, the kind of car sharing economy where people are moving away from the idea of car ownership. And, and, and more towards a sort of uh, micro rental model uh, that's very, very dynamic. I need a car, it needs to be 100 meters distance from me. Okay, let me find it on this app. And you could imagine a similar kind of thing happening for space. So that yeah. rather than everybody being so attached to their spaces and therefore the, the use of the space being so exclusive and, and quite honestly, very inefficient, um, maybe we will see patterns in society where it's absolutely acceptable um, to be, a, you know, a respected uh, global architecture practice that doesn't have a physical base, but that just adapts that uh, that office space or that working place or even the living space um, in a very dynamic and, and optimized way. And this is moving beyond solving the problems that Anthony's highlighted through purely built infrastructure. But it's like, how do we use that infrastructure in a more smart way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I, th I think I mean fully agree, Ben. And I think probably the way the way we see now spaces for future. And I think COVID. I mean, you mentioned that for living, but I think also for for working. I think we see more and more that we are going to design a places where we will have to to work, to live, and to entertain. Entertain. And when we are thinking about moving things within building, uh, I mean, the first thing we see is that I mean. 
let's say buildings are going to be hyper connected. So, so, so it's not going to be just about connecting people, which is the traditional use, particularly in work spaces, but also also using artificial intelligence to, 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 to do remote monitoring, remote operation. Uh, I, I think user experience, uh, I think will uh, health and well-being will become not just a premium, just a, a standard. I, I think COVID has shown now the big demand for open spaces, windows, terraces in a lot of countries. And also the idea of we will have to successful buildings are such buildings that have also, I mean, from our experience, vertical transportation, successful vertical transportation. But we need to believe that we will not only transport people, but we also transport goods. And I think you mentioned a very important thing, Ben, which is data. I think some of these vertical nodes become also data highways to try to understand what is happening in the building, how buildings react to the use of the building. And, and, and I think that is probably a different discussion on dimensions, on, on what, what do we move in buildings? What, how do yeah. we use buildings? Yeah, maybe. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, uh, Ben and, and Javier. I, I think data, indeed, um, uh, it's it's crazy to see what is happening based on the data that you are able to collect from these buildings. And actually, we have an we have an audience question already to to that point. Um, let, let me bring it up. And, and actually, uh, Ben, I was inspired to hear. I mean, a respectable architecture company can f function without a, a physical locality. Uh, well, you know, I, I, have, I, I, I don't think we're. I don't think we're there yet uh, because it's sort of socially embedded the idea that you know somebody that's an entity that's trustworthy and established you know has its headquarters and its space and things but i think that that's you know that's shifting and you see it for example in 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 my city here the the serviced office market is really booming as as business is a little bit cautious about committing long term with these volatile times but it's it's becoming much more nimble and 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 sort of the idea of being based out of a temporary uh, serviced offices that can expand or contract based on sort of project requirements or staff requirements is becoming basically uh, uh, normalized. Uh, so I think we'll see that you know reflecting in the in the way that buildings are designed um, as as patterns of use change. And I, I would love to know actually more. Uh, this is going out of the topic, but as the metaverse is being built and digital buildings are being built, where people kind of live in a hybrid virtual physical combination where you are working both inside a virtual building and, and a physical building how, how that looks like but before we go there let's take a question from the audience we have richard thank you richard for 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 posing the question let's take it right away which because i think this fits to the topic of of of, of building use so we can all I, I can read it out loud um highly varied mixed use towers are becoming more prominent and viable in the future city with so many functions retail, commercial, office, residential, etc. How will tall building evolve to effectively and safely accommodate so many different users? It's cutting off the rest of the question, but but how, how do you combine all of these things? I mean, do you just build bigger towers or or kind of what's what's your take on, on Richard's question? Who who wants to go first? I can jump in on that, um, Nico. It actually Okay, can you show my slide number slide number three, which is about mixed use towers? I just want to I just want to echo what Richard is saying there. Um, you know, we do a study, um, uh, we, we do data studies every year, and um, this is a study that looks at the hundred tallest buildings at the end of each decade. So you can see here that as recently as the year two thousand, not a long time ago. 83% of the 100 tallest buildings in the world were all office buildings. You know, that is now 36% and falling. There has been a major, major shift towards mixed use buildings, as Richard is saying there, 40, 49%, I think that is. You know, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, not least that, you know, only developers are edging their bets on residential market and office market and retail market, not all being down at the same time. But again, I would argue that that is not yet going far enough. And I'd like you, if you can, Nico, just to jump to my slides at the end where I, I talk about the future city. Um, yeah, so so let me just put this proposition across to you because it is linked to, it's linked to mixed use, but it's also linked to what Ben was talking about and Javier in terms of infrastructure. So imagine this scenario. This at the moment is a high, is a mid-rise city, 
yeah? It's just a conceptual idea. Mid-rise city, and a million people live there. And, and what I want to point out here are the things in colour. Um, so this is not a high-rise city, but the things in colour represent infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, I don't just mean physical, linear infrastructure, like streets and power and water and sewage. I do mean that. But I also mean social infrastructure, meaning park, garden, um, sidewalk, school, doctor's surgery, shop. This all exists at the ground plane. Okay, so move forward with the slides, please. You'll see, so this this city, existing city of 1 million, over the next 10 years is going to 10 million. Um, so where do those other 9 million people go? So do they go horizontal? No. You know, the city cannot spread horizontally because of the energy, well, land use, and the energy it takes to create and operate the horizontal city. So there's only one direction that those people, those 9 million people can go, and that is vertical. And there is the vision of a beautiful uh, future city. No, absolutely no, because all those projects there, those white boxes, are office, residential, hotel, or some variation of those three things. That is not the city. What happened to the infrastructure I just talked about? All those other functions. So I believe, and we at the book council believe, that the, the building needs to become almost like a piece of that two-dimensional infrastructure-rich plane flipped vertical with the infrastructure, with the gardens, with the social spaces, with the schools, with the shops, with the surgeries. And the vision of cities of the future is really what we call the sustainable vertical urbanism because we put 9 million more people living on the same plot of land. So therefore, we need to recreate all those service functions, all those social functions and the infrastructure up in the sky. So back to Richard's questions. Yes, we have seen a shift towards mixed use, but it's still, you know, mixed use. Putting a bookshop in the lobby and a restaurant on the top of the building is not mixed use. There are so many things, and that is, the, for me, the future of the city. We need to bring all aspects of the city up into the vertical realm. Thanks. Yeah, I Thank quite you. agree. But, you know, what, what tends to happen, and I'm just, uh, let's say, putting across the, the sort of the, you know, let's say I'm putting across the, the problem. Uh, the problem is that a lot of times the developer understands the value of that amenity, be it a park, a river, a seafront, uh, and and then the benefit of that amenity is is essentially absorbed by the maximum number of people, units, office space, whatever else that you can put adjacent to that. And and it's it's very rare, unfortunately, to have a developer that has the sort of the vision uh, and perhaps the, the the freedom to let's say, build that th those amenity elements of the infrastructure into the building. And it seems to me that it's really only in, in um, environments where the city uh, governance really puts quite a pressure on the individual developer, uh, let's say, in relation to the amount of area or, or units or, or saleable um, uh, yield that they, that they develop, that they must return these things to the city. And that, to me, seems like a fair... A fair balance, really, and and and, but it, it really does rely on a, on a, um, you know, a, 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 a kind of overarching governmental uh, incentive. Uh, it's rare that that just um, spontaneously emerges from the uh, generally more self-oriented uh, approach that that, or, or let's say, dynamics that are the the major force um, behind most of the building projects that that we're dealing with. Actually, I, I go a stage further there, Ben, and what I didn't say is, I mean, to deliver that vision that I've just um, shown requires a complete rethought of, the, of how cities are conceived, because if we leave it to the owner developers who are looking to make a financial return, um, it won't happen, and that's no disrespect to the owner developers, they're looking for a financial return, but here's the thing. That city that I've just shown with the infrastructure-rich infrastructure vertical realm needs to be delivered through public-private partnership. Who is it that pays for the shops and the, and, the, and the sidewalks and the parks and the sewage, everything at the minute, you know, the infrastructure at the ground plane? It's the government. Well, we just put 9 million people paying 9 million more taxes there. So, we, yeah. so, the, so those layers of infrastructure need to be incorporated in the buildings and the buildings themselves need to become public-private partnership. It's not down to the only developer to pay for the park. 
It's down to the, you know, to the government. And we need this collective vision of sustainable vertical urbanism. And by the way, the reason that it's not happening, we probably don't want to go too far down this path, is because the lack of political will. You know, the short termism of like, you know, re-election in three, four years. So the places where it has happened, and back to your slide, Nico, about Singapore, um, you know, being one of the, you know, voted one of the best cities. That's why it's happened in Singapore and places like that, because it's not the short termism um, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, political structure. Uh, the reality is that Singapore has gone head and shoulders above any other city, in my view. In, in trying to deliver on all these things that we're talking about, sky bridges, urban habitat in the sky, green walls, all these things, because it's taken a view and delivered on a view that's 40, 50 years you know, long, not, not three, four years. But, but financially, what I've presented there, I think, can stack up, but we need to rethink how cities are conceived. Thanks, thanks, um, Anthony and, and Benjamin and Javier. I'm, I'm coming back to you now. Uh, but Richard, I think you got a good uh, answer to your to your question. Uh, there's more coming. Uh, please, please uh, keep doing so. Um, and I think uh, with, with the climate goals that we are now, uh, we have to meet as a society. Then it's really only about partnership. It only can happen together. So really exciting to see how this vision is, is going to happen. But let's, let's, uh, let's go uh, to talk a little bit about the vision that Anthony just showed with us, where you have cities which are interconnected with each other. Obviously, you need highly efficient ways of moving people. So we come to the mobility topic. We come to the favorite topic of Javier. So, <laughs> and, and, and we all, all know the pressure. Uh, to, to facilitate that movement rather emissions free, you know, and not any cars burging uh, fossil fuels uh, for sure. So looking at the, the view of, of the future of the tall buildings that we just saw from Anthony, and maybe also reflecting on, on Ben, what you just said about what architects are designing and what is the pressure from, from, from the developers, what, where is the mobility going and what are some of the innovations uh, we have been seeing and also we can see at the world expo yeah i'm, I'm talking to mr mobility here obviously <laughs> yeah no th thanks very much in 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 i i think i i love obviously i mean from on one on one side the the, the vision of of um, let's say uh, breaking our um, idea that the building is just a vertical um, uh, place a a, a vertical element that uh, I, I think I think some of the architects call it a donut building which where where you have if we see the way we are building uh, buildings today I mean most of the core of the building is, is elevator sounds and, 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 and let's say I mean let, let's face it I mean elevator industry is an industry that haven't changed much in the last almost 160 years because it was just a cabin and a, and a counterweight moving up and down okay um, and, and on, on that I think uh, uh, let's say our company has developed a, a visionary solution. Uh, by the way, I mean fits very much with with Anthony's Anthony's vision, which is able to connect buildings on different dimensions. I mean, uh, so just imagine that um, uh, I mean that technology is, is called multi. We show it in the in the Dubai Expo, and the idea here is is to connect people um, not just uh, at the uh, vertical level, but also at the, at the horizontal at horizontal level this is a, a technology that probably started to think when when first we try to move more than one cabin in one shaft with a, what we call let's say a twin solution so this enable to reduce the space needed i mean for 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 high rise buildings and and probably give more freedom to 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 use better the space to reduce, I think you were mentioning uh, um, uh, uh, sustainability, embodied carbon. Yeah? So, so this is something that that obviously mm, give us already 15 years ago the opportunity to start to think differently, to increase the capacity, to reduce the way the sustainability. Um, but from that technology, uh, what we did was move to a something completely different, which was a multi-technology, which is what we are showcasing in, in, in Expo. Right? So, so, so just imagine that instead of having these cabins with one row, now we just take out the row and propel multiple cabins to move independently in, in one shaft. So, so we will give architects like, like Ben, uh, let's say, the, the opportunity to design vertical buildings without limitation in height or in uh, horizontal connection um, uh, we will give them multiple possibilities and that is also the reason why we call it multi but 
this also gives the possibility to connect buildings to the cities, building to the public infrastructure. So, so part of the vision that that Anthony Anthony was was showing, because we truly believe that buildings cannot become vertical uh, 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 cities, isolated silos. I mean, buildings need to speak to cities, okay? Uh, need to connect to cities, and people need to live. Uh, uh, interconnected uh, and that's why some of these uh, uh, technologies like 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 multi enable those visions uh, i do agree with also with ben i mean definitely i mean uh, i i think the challenge is also how we can let's say bring to the same table the interest of developers of 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 uh, cities i mean maybe to challenge ben question i mean who is owning that those horizontal links on the sky. Eh? So, so who is going to own those spaces, those, those air, let's say, spaces? And, and what is the best use for those spaces? I mean, we clearly see a, a mobility will become 3D. And, and when I'm saying 3D, it's not just a street level or underground, but also at the sky level with the sky bridges. Mm -hmm. And we have seen, I, I think, CBTUH has, I mean, seen uh, and, and also price a lot of examples of, of buildings with horizontal links we see that more and more um, i think also in dubai there is also a very interesting uh, uh, let's say developments on on, on sky level uh, uh, and, and i think that uh, i would like to see that view happening because we will be able to free up a space out of the street which is where we see all these cities very very congested yeah look uh, i think it, you know it makes me think about how um i mean it's interesting if you take uh, nasa for example when nasa is developing new kind of technologies or, or let's say strategies for uh, reaching new heights they'll actually look at the the trajectory for other technologies developing and then try to match that trajectory with with it with other trajectories so that uh, that they're, they're coming together uh, at a future point um, at the same time when the various technologies have matured and i think it's quite interesting to remember that in approximately one minute, there's enough energy landing on the surface of the planet to power all of this world cities and all of humankind for a year. And that's just mm -hmm. sunlight. I mean, you could think about uh, geothermal, you can think mm -hmm. about fission, and it's more or less a technological uh, problem that I'm pretty confident in humankind that we can solve, that we're you know coming up to a period of time where energy may be in such abundant quantities that it is no longer something that constrains us in, as it has in the past and uh, and that's not that's not science fiction that's that's the reality that's the energy that is that is present it's just how to convert that um, and i think one of the things that's uh, perhaps slightly uh, challenging with the multi-system at the moment it's, it's quite energy intensive because it is relying on the sort of maglev vertical maglev uh, type of system rather than the cables and the, and the counterweights that you mentioned before but i think it's a wonderful opportunity to be free of the the traditional constraints uh, and really think well what if what if what if we could connect um you know from from the subway on a different plot directly to your apartment in a building or or what if we could get away with take cores completely out of towers and just use the surface of towers as the the means of of moving uh vertically or or horizontally uh what if we could all have uh, you know personal uh flying drones and the streets of the city could be converted back into the parks and the amenities uh, that anthony was talking about and we have this whole multi-layered and super efficient um transport network uh in you know in in the in the sky so these are they are on one hand you could say uh on the cusp of science fiction but they're also on the cusp of reality and like my point earlier with 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 uh, with the, the the engineers of nasa needing to look at all forms of technological development um, i'm sure within our own lifetimes um, we'll see these come into being and they will have a radical impact on the forms uh, of our buildings and the possibilities uh, of our buildings that's uh so, you we bring out uh, NASA Ben uh, science fiction and indeed if I look at some of some of the designs I mean they do remind me of, of Blade Runner but in a nice way it's uh, it's kind of a positive version of Blade Runner where 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 movement of people is much more clean um, before we wrap up because we are running out of broadcast time because we have so many different aspects to cover um, 
I, I want to talk a little bit about sustainability and, and maybe you can also wrap up as, as, as we close uh, this session, because I know there are, there are uh, people in the audience who are also thinking about, well, how do you make these cities sustainable? How do you uh, reduce these emissions? Um, what can we do to make especially high rises even more energy efficient? And maybe Anthony, if I start again with you, because you made a study about the, 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 the efficiency of using high rises versus low rises and how some people have a misconception that high rises are more energy incentive, which they kind of are, but then kind of not, if you look from, from a city level. But, but before uh, you, you go there, Anthony, let me also ask the final question from my side to, to everybody, because we have also a young audience. We have young architects out there, wannabe architects who want to become Ben. Uh, they want to become Anthony, and they're designing. They're actually designing the city so 2050. So, what would what what would be your advice to these young people who want to design cities which are clean, they're sustainable, and they are very livable? People want to work and live th live there. So, lots a lot of questions in once. But Arthur Anthony, let's let's start with you. So the study you referred to, we, we, we did a study where we we took uh, 200 households living in high-rise buildings in Chicago and compared them with 200 households living in um, seven miles outside the city in the suburb of Oak Park. Uh, and, and, and we evaluated everything. We evaluated their energy bills, their, their transport movements, the embodied energy of the home. We, we evaluated everything over a two-year period. And I can tell you that the results were surprising, shocking in some cases. For example, I'll just tell you one, car ownership in the high-rise buildings was higher than the suburb. And, and the reason was because we took these three buildings and didn't realize that um, they were all inhabited by extremely rich, retired people who had nothing to do all day except get in their car and drive back out to the suburbs to see their friends. So, you know, so the, so the study was skewed, but the, the positive finding was that really it's all about the infrastructure. It's all, the, 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 the future of cities is about the collective benefits of urban density. It's not, a, it's not a, just about the building. You know, and Ben said earlier about, you know, that it's not just about tall buildings are the way to achieve density. It's a, but it is about the collective benefits of, 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 of urban density in two senses. Preservation of land, using less land and less energy to create and operate the city. So basically, the suburban home required something like 714 percent of linear infrastructure to support it as to the person living downtown and that was the key finding you know seven eight times more infrastructure in roads and and rail and you know water and electricity and all that and and, and, that, and that is that is absolutely massive and um, to go to your question about you know architects of the future and re really we need a multi-pronged approach uh, we need a multi-pronged approach. There's no one solution to all this. I mean, at the very big level, first thing we need to do is move to a carbon economy. Absolutely no brainer. Car you know, nothing will change till we move to a carbon economy and actually factor in carbon. So at the very big political, social, economic levels, things need to happen. And then at the design level, we need to build out a mass timber. So it's a total game changer. It's the only material that is a game changer. And um, we need to introduce green walls, we need to introduce social space, all these things. So it's not a one liner. But what I would say to the architects, the future bends that are perhaps tuning in looking at this is it is an exciting future. We will get there. We will get there. I mean, what Ben just said there, one, you know, in one minute we get enough energy falling on this planet to power a year. It's about how do we translate it? How do we take it and how do we store it? We're not waiting for new technologies really to, to, to save us. The, the technologies and the ability to solve climate problems, sustainability problems, are with us. We just need the collective social and political will to do it. And before we go to future Ben, um, let, let's go to future Javier. Uh, Javier, what are your advice to the young architects out there who want to build sustainability uh, into the cities going going forward? I, I think I absolutely agree with uh, with uh, with Anthony on the on the approach, and and, and maybe let, let me put a, a very simple approach that many cities are taking uh, uh, as, as of today, and we see that uh, all across Europe, but we should also start to see that in Asia Pacific. I mean, we all, I mean, are become let's say older aging of population, so there is, I mean, let's say two key elements. One of them is the impact of road transportation. The other one is definitely 
aging of population. I mean, there is a study that says that maybe between 30 to 80 percent of the of the CO2 emissions can be avoided by pedestrianization of cities. So speaking about that, let's say collective, let's say uh, you call it a, a collective benefit. Uh, I mean, we have seen in different uh, cities, I mean, uh, worldwide, uh, Spain being one of them, but also Hong Kong, um, uh, where, where they have, let's say, taken a public and private uh, uh, partnership to start to pedestrianize cities. And, and I think that has a very, very interesting benefit. On one side, you eliminate cars out of that area. You start to build, let's say, what, what I think I think most of the architects call that 15-minute city, which is a city where you can make your life go to commerce. And, and that is a very interesting way. We have seen, I mean, Hong Kong is a very good example with the sky bridges. I mean, historical buildings in, 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 in Spain also are doing that, taking out the cars of that those old songs. And, and in some cases, that is even the only mobility solution for that people in the aging, uh, aging population. So uh, advice, uh, to keep it short, I think, uh, obviously, speaking about mobility for those future designs, I mean, we need to make sure that mobility shall be, shall be sustainable, shall be fully accessible to all, and shall, shall also be inclusive. Mm -hmm. And mm, the view of mobility needs to be, we will be moving people, but also goods and also data. Eh? I think those are the probably three dimensions we need to take into account when, when looking into, into, into mobility in the three dimensions, a sky, a street and underground level. Yeah, thanks, Javier. Looking forward to the innovation still coming, I think, to, to facilitate all these things. Future Ben, what are you saying to the younger Bens out there? Uh, well, look, I think that at the root of every architect's passion uh, is this notion that you can make the world a better place uh, and that you can make a tangible difference um, using your brain, but translating your brain and your ideas into physical form um, that is actually manifest perhaps long after you're, you're gone as an individual, but that, that, that can kind of echo through society in the way that the buildings are used. And I suppose, you know, the number one most responsible and most sustainable thing that you can do as an architect is to make sure that whatever you're building uh, is going to last for as long as it possibly can. Um, and, and so that it remains, and, and in order to do that, it must remain relevant. Uh, it must be flexible. Um, it must be valued by society. Maybe even it's just so aesthetically stunning piece of work that it never gets knocked down and it just becomes preserved and a kind of a, a symbol of, of, of aesthetic beauty. Uh, there's many ways to go about it, but I think, you know, this, this word sustainable architecture, uh, you know, really needs to be unpacked. It's not just the, let's say the building physics aspect of sustainable say, sustainability. Um, but it's, it's in a way even more simple than that. It's, uh, it's what do you need to do to make the, the building come off the page, off the drawings and translate into reality um, and, and become uh, realized? But what do you do to make sure that, that that isn't just building? There's plenty of building going on in the world, but there's less architecture. Architecture is where there's some kind of germ of an idea, some kind of investigation, some kind of higher level aspiration that is expressed through the building and explored through the building. And I think if I would give any advice to young architects or any architect, I suppose, and certainly advice I try to give myself, is that every single project that you do should have that special moment of, of contribution, I suppose, to trying to make the world a better place and expressing that through uh, the form of architecture. Wow. Thank you, Ben. I think these were very wise words, making the world a better place, also making the world a brighter place, what we do at Covestro. We are out of our broadcast time, so thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, Javier, for taking the time out of your, I know, busy schedules to discuss these, I think, very exciting topics that really affect us all going forward. And I think you put uh, us a lot of positive inspiration, how the future may be the positive kind of Blade Runner with cities which are interconnected, vertical and horizontal. The technology is there and the data is being put to good use. 
Thank you so much for joining. Thank you also for audience for giving your commentary um, to us and um, look forward to seeing you again soon. And definitely we have to redo this because there are so many aspects of future cities we still have to, we still have to discuss uh, going forward. Thank you very much for joining. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. So we will return to the World Expo topics um, quite soon on the topic of energy, really green energy. So stay tuned on our channel as we announce the updates. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and bye-bye. <laughs>